Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last Art and Focus event of our 2023 season or our spring 2023 season. I'm Michelle DeMarzo, the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement at the Fairfield University Art Museum. If this is your first time tuning in to one of our virtual Art and Focus events, uh, these are focused around a single work of art, although today we're stretching that slightly to a group of artworks that all share the same title. And we structure it simply as an informal conversation. And these virtual sessions always follow an in-person event here at the museum. And also unusually for this particular iteration, we gathered right here in the museum classroom as opposed to down the hall in the Bellarmine Hall galleries. In part, so, and I'm going to Tilt my screen slightly as you can see what is behind me on some tables. The group of artwork that we were discussing uh, are on small easels and they're flanking one of the objects from our historic plaster cast collection for reasons that we can return to. Uh, as we always say with these art and focus sessions, uh, please chime in at any time with your observations, your questions. It's always my pleasure to sort of report back on some of the questions and observations that our in-person visitors have shared with me. And we'll get a, me off the screen and focus on one of the four artworks in this series, the one that I used for the advertising for this particular talk. And all of these artworks, as I said, share the same title. They are called Core 674. So I'm actually going to show you all four of them just briefly. You might notice some similarities between them as well as some differences. All of them are signed by the artist and have the date and the title written on them. These are all from 2021. Oops, back I go, wrong direction. There we go. Uh, Core 674 is these four photographs by, as I said, James Welling. He is a Connecticut-born uh, visual artist, mostly a photographer, although I have to admit that I started our in-person session by placing these individual prints onto the table. So we have four tables put together, our guests were sitting around, uh, putting them onto the table and opening the mats and inviting our visitors to really look closely at them and think about what they saw and see if there was anything about the image, the surface, the texture, that might set it apart from what we typically think of with a photograph. So bringing back some of our pairings. Uh, the one on the left, I think, is more unusual looking on screen almost because of the, the highlighted color. But some of the others in the series, they don't look like you expect a photograph to look. For one thing, the surface of the paper, question mark, is matte, M-A-T-T-E. It's not glossy as we might expect a, a photograph to look. Uh, I said paper question mark because having lightly handled the edges of the objects myself as I was maneuvering them to see uh, the reverse, I already knew that they are not paper. And if we look at the full description on the label, the caption of the one that I chose, Core 674 oil paint and laser print on Pronto plate. So a Pronto plate, Although a, um, the name of this particular product might not give us any hint or indication, but it is a um, polyester lithographic plate, something commercially available. But to my finger, the edge of it sort of felt, imagine almost like a vellum. Very much not the kind of support we'd expect to find a photograph on and not the kind of surface texture we expect of a photograph. So as we just saw, oil paint on top of a laser printed photograph. Uh, these objects, these images are individual and they are also part of the series. They're actually part of, I'll hold up to the camera, uh, a particular project called Cento that James Welling did that we are lucky enough to have a number of artworks donated to the museum. But it was very interesting to put these artworks on the table without the people in person having seen the caption. They did not know what these things were made of, although I had described James Welling as a photographer. And they were noticing sort of the very texture. You can see the black background of the one on the right. There just seems to be a lot of intervention on the surface. And especially as these objects are shifted in the light, you become very apparent that it is not, in fact, a regular printed photograph. It becomes clearer upon close inspection that there's paint on top of something else. And I shared with them the um, description of his process by this artist. And I mean, 
it's wild. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it takes several paragraphs to describe. Uh, and he explains how he prints the images, some of which he has taken himself of artifacts, some of which he has sourced from online, the way he transfers them onto this lithographic plate that's made of this very thin, flexible polyester, and how he paints on the surface of what he has printed to create something that he describes producing a unique image as much a painting as a photograph, which someone was asking me if these are, you know, replicas, if they are multiples. And the answer is like every one of them has been uniquely painted on by James Welling himself. Those of you who were participating in our last month's Art in Focus, where we looked at the Ethel Fisher oil on canvas painting that is currently on view in our In Their Elements exhibition, might remember that I had explained how we got that and other works by Ethel Fisher was that we had asked for the donation of an Ethel Fisher painting. Uh, we did not receive it, but we were contacted by the artist's daughter saying, you know, we're so delighted that you're interested in my mother's work. Maybe there are other things we could donate to the Fairfield University Art Museum. And the way we got into contact with James Welling was actually very similar. We had asked for a donation of some of his work through an online program. And although we weren't successful with our first request, he reached out and said, hey, I grew up in Connecticut. I am interested in finding out more about the Fairfield University Art Museum. And it turned out he was very interested to know that we have this historic plaster cast collection because some of his recent work had engaged with artifacts from the Greek and Roman past. In fact, the title of this whole series, those of you who love uh, ancient Greek art, kore might be a familiar word to you. For those for whom it is not, I'm going to go forward now to the inspiration. James Welling's inspiration for this series is a physical artifact, a marble sculpture from the archaic, late archaic period of Greece. You see the dates on screen between 500 and 490 BCE. And Kore refers to the kind of sculpture that this is, a sculpture of an idealized, beautiful young woman. We see her hair and it's very intricate uh, sort of curling array and falling down over her shoulders. We see the wonderfully carved folds of her robe. And we can also see, especially in the image on the left, you might be able to make out that this is not a pure white sculpture. One of the things that sets Core 674 apart from many other statues of young women, uh, all of them individually known as one Core or multiple Korai for the plural of the feminine, uh, many of them have completely lost their original painted surface. Core 674 was unearthed in 1888 in excavations on the Acropolis in Athens, and she still had some of her original painted surfaces remaining. So it's on her eyes. You can see it on her robe, especially on the, um, the edges. And that is unusual, again, because it is not that common. And that's something that was very interesting to James Welling. Because what he has done in the series, one series called Cento, another series called Personae, he takes photographs of these ancient objects and then he enlivens them or the word, I'm sorry, that he used reanimates. That's the word he prefers to use. So he talks about reanimating uh, uh, 674 and he not only uses oil paint to add lustrous and quite vivid color. That was the one of the things that really puzzled one of our in-person guests a few moments ago. She was looking at it as if it was a photograph to start with and just was wondering about the intensity of the color and then it became clear that that's actually oil paint added on top by James Welling but he does something even further so he has an ancient object it has been photographed with very modern technology it has been laser printed onto a lithographic plate we are really mixing our technologies it has had oil paint applied on its surface and the eyes are ones he transposes from other artworks so in this case, he said the green eyes of Core 674, which are visible very much in three of the four, the one on the left has her eyes averted. He said that he chose from a painting, uh, bar, he borrowed them from a painting by Edouard Manet. Now I have not been successful in figuring out exactly which Manet painting that he borrowed these eyes from. So if any of you think you have guessed uh, what is the source, the Manet source of the eyes for Core 674? Please feel free to drop it in the chat because I would love to know. But the result is something that is uh, very striking, but also, as we said, unique. 
every one of these is a very much a singular object. But in everyone, there's sort of an intensity, but also a playfulness, because you get the sense that James Welling, the artist, is feeling very comfortable and very free in putting his own interpretation on the original appearance of these ancient objects. And again, Core 674 is only one of those that he has made these alterations to. Uh, it happened to be of particular interest to those of us in the museum because we have, um, you might be able to see over my shoulder, among our historic plaster cast objects is another Core, which I have actually a photograph of in the slideshow, Uthidicus's Core, uh, which is not an original marble sculpture, but rather a plaster cast after a marble original of circa 480. But it's the same kind of object as Core 674, a statue of an idealized young woman. You see those very stylized ridges of her hair. And much like Core 674, the original of Uthidicus's Core also was discovered with just a little hint of the original color remaining. And this was replicated on the plaster cast by tinting the area of her mouth and a little bit in her eyes. So just a way to hint to the viewer, yes, you're looking at a plaster replica of a marble original, but that marble original has traces of what once was. Looking at someone in our chat. Olivia said, what made you want to talk about this group of artwork this month? That's a great question. I will be very very honest and say that it was entirely about practicality and it was practicality in the sense that the semester has ended the students are no longer here which means the classroom is available at noon on a thursday uh or i shouldn't say at noon on thursday at 11 on a thursday uh because it made a little bit more sense to me to spread out our four objects with our group of participants around the table in here as opposed to where we typically find ourselves uh down the hall in the classroom or sorry down the hall in the galleries so I thought, ah, okay, while the students are away, I can move this plaster cast from the corner where it stands on top of a podium. I can shift it further up into the classroom. That is a great question. Sometimes it, it really is about what will work with space and availability that we have. Uh, Janet Krauss says, Welling has made his reanimation of the Core a member of the Me Too movement. She has a wry expression. Oh, Janet, I, I would love if you would expand on that comment or someone else jump in to respond to what Janet just said, making the quarry a member of the Me Too movement because of her wry expression. Oops, go back. There's Corey, original Corey 674 in her home in um, Athens at the Acropolis Museum. And if any of our viewers have visited the Acropolis Museum, I would love to hear about your experiences of that as well. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Fairfield University and our historic plaster cast collection, may know that Catherine Schwab, who is professor of art history and curator of the plaster cast collection, her life's work has been reconstructing the, um, the metopes, which are the square low relief sculpture on the exterior of the Parthenon, reconstructing the damaged metopes. Uh, and if you visit the Acropolis Museum, you will find the metopes themselves installed in one of the very light filled galleries and her reconstruction drawings are actually on the wall labels accompanying the sculptures. So it's a wonderful example of Fairfield University faculty expertise out in the wider world. And I hope you'll take a look at that the next time that you visit the Acropolis Museum. I have to say I only visited Athens once and it was in 2006, which was the year before this museum opened. So I deeply look forward to visiting in the future and being able to see Dr. Schwab's work. And if you visit us at Fairfield, and are able to walk down the hallway to the galleries where we have installed some of our Parthenon casts. Uh, those that are metopes have Dr. Schwab's reconstruction drawings next to them. And just recently, she has added not only a reconstruction drawing, but a reconstruction coloring, a reanimation of her own. And of course, what Dr. Schwab is doing is trying to be as scholarly and accurate as possible. And here we have an artist taking from a slightly different perspective. He is not required to, for example, determine precisely whether her headdress would be solid, as he has painted it on the left, or to give it some sort of a geometric uh, pattern, as he's done in the version on the right, right? An artist is free to sort of interpret as he chooses. And in other uh, objects, especially in his Personae series, which you can look at his, his website online, he mentions that he chooses, you know, hair accessories and things that he knows are ahistorical. So he is not looking to become an archaeological 
a reconstructor in that way, the way a academic might be, but is playing with reanimating and bringing them back to life. But what he's doing is also interesting because it's part of a larger conversation that many of you may be very familiar with about the nature of ancient marble sculpture and the growing understanding that these not only had little bits of paint on them originally, but were in fact very vividly colored. And those of you who are in the New York metropolitan area might have visited um, the Ancient World in Color show that was at the Metropolitan. I'm actually not sure if it's if it's still open, where they placed uh, painted reconstructions in the galleries alongside the statues that appear to us today in 2023 to be only white. So this is the pro the product of a very long um, series of discussions in the academic world that emerged from objects like Uthidicus's Corey, like Corey 674, when archaeological remnants would come out and be like, hmm, there seems to be a little bit of paint on here. And of course, as technology has improved over time, um, laboratory scientists can extract small bits of pigment um, that are not even really visible to us anymore, but that might be hiding in a crevice somewhere where they survived, that might at least be able to say, this particular pigment was present on this sculpture at some time. And what uh, archaeologists and art historians have been discussing and debating for now several decades is what did these sculptures really look like if we could visit Athens in 480 BCE, you know, would the colors be as high key as what we are seeing here? Would they be even maybe more vivid and bold like here? There are those who argue that perhaps they would have been a little bit toned down. So I don't want to present this as in any way something that has been um, settled and established, that there is a clear understanding of exactly what each of these pieces look like originally. There is, however, a general consensus. They were colored and the color was vivid. And it makes a lot of sense if you're thinking about a great building like the Parthenon, for example, where the sculpture was intended to be seen from far below on the ground. And of course, a pure marble relief would be really hard to make out, but one that is painted in vivid shades of yellow, blue, um, and red would be much easier to read from the ground. Got some other comments coming in. Oh gosh, Dr. Schwab is on. Well, I'm going to just uh, apologize to Dr. Schwab for anything incorrect that I've said so far. No pressure, right? Uh, Janet adds, Welling has even made the Corey's nose crooked to emphasize her cockiness and assertiveness. I like this. We are, we're detecting the personality of Corey 674. Dr. Schwab, our expert who is with us right now, Corey 674 has a very subtle expression to her lips, best understood as the hint of a demure smile. This is part of a stylistic trend among the Cori series and what the sculptors, oops, and what the sculptors could carve. The change is from an archaic smile to a somber expression seen in the Uthidicus's Cori. And thank you for that, Dr. Schwab. And Amelda adds, could the eyes be from Manet's The Bar at the Folies Bergere? Uh, that was my guess as well. Uh, it's interesting when you look up Manet, especially his portraits, how many, and I'll go back to one of the ones that is looking at us sort of head on, how many Manet images have a, especially a woman's face, very close to the picture plane. But of course, when you think of Manet and a woman looking at you, you might think of the bar at the Folies Bergère. Uh, and of course, he's tinted the eyes to this very brilliant emerald color of green. But I agree, Imelda, that is one of the first things that I thought of as well as the potential source for the green eyes that help James Welling reanimate Corey 674. Any other observations or questions. I'm noticing too as I look at these on screen, the changing color of her ear ornament from the photograph, I'm calling it a photograph, the painted photograph on the left to this lovely turquoise that he's chosen and the image on the right. And I'm going back, oops. And in the image here on the left, he's chosen almost a spiral pattern. He's given her a little bit of blue on the right. I just love looking at the different choices that he's made in each of these. And as I said, when we were looking at them together in person, shifting them in the light became very apparent. The, the presence of the oil paint on the surface of this very thin um, polyester, uh, polyester plate. So to go back to a question that was asked earlier, why did I choose to want to talk about these today? They're so cool looking. They're so cool looking. And I can imagine that for one thing, photographs, um, uh, 
photographs and works on paper are difficult to uh, exhibit for any length of time because of their delicacy. So I was thinking about, we've gotten these incredible donations. Of course, we want people to be exposed to them, to have an opportunity to see them. And it is unusual to have an opportunity to see them sort of on um, a table as opposed to behind glass in the gallery. So I would imagine, although I haven't seen these put in a frame with glass in front of them, that it would be more difficult to see the texture of those objects once in that setting, if they were hanging on the wall in the gallery, than to have the privilege of looking at them in a group spread around the table was just something I look forward to. And I'm delighted to say it was a lot of fun to do with the guests that we had. And in fact, one of the visitors, her husband was not able to join her, but she said they were looking ahead to they are going to Athens next month and they'll be going to the museum, which, of course, is what we got me started telling them about Dr. Schwab's reconstruction drawings. Uh, so she said she came because she just wanted to anything involving the ancient world was something that she wanted to engage with. And I think one of the things that draws people back to the Kouros and the Kore statues, you might have seen some of them at the Metropolitan or at other museums, is that there is something very immediate about them even in the absence of paint. But you add a little color, you add a little red and some green and some yellow. You add that, you give sort of life to that slight smile that Janet said made her think of a, a me too or a, a knowing sense. And they really do seem to become alive. So we were uh, discussing briefly in our, our group in here, comparing this to our last month's um, object, which was an oil on canvas painting. We said, you know, that's such a traditional way of making art, right? Oil on canvas. And here's James Welling combining, we have photographic technology, printing technology, the very old tradition of oil painting. And he's creating something very new. When sometimes I think we might uh, assume that aside from AI art, like, you know, have artists hit a wall? Have they, you know, hit a wall in creating new ways to engage and intervene with art objects? And the answer is no. I mean, true artists will always find new ways of doing things. But I think it's interesting that as his subject, he has taken some of these ancient artifacts from the Western tradition and used them as the material to make something that is so striking and is so new. So for those of you who cannot visit the Fairfield University Art Museum in person, you know we have our uh, collections database that is online. You can actually browse all of the works by James Welling that we have. If you go to fairfield.edu slash museum and click on collections, you can access the database from there. Uh, his work is under copyright, so you will find that you are not able to enlarge a lot of the images uh, because that's just the nature of artistic copyright. These are made in 2021. So these are, are very recent works indeed. But you can get a sense of the, uh, the work that James has donated to the museum, for which we are very grateful. And perhaps one day in the not so far future, we will find an exhibition that will have these Core 674 works on the wall in the gallery, and you'll be able to see them in person. And with that, thank you for joining me for our last Art and Focus of the uh, spring 2023 season, and we will look forward to seeing you, whether in person or virtually, in our fall season. Take care, everyone. <music>